And speaking of someone who acts with style and grace, it is now my honor to introduce a man that provided our community with hope and leadership during another time in which hope was desperately needed, the start of the AIDS pandemic. It's my honor tonight to introduce my friend and mentor, Cleve Jones. <laughs> Sit down, honey, you got a long bio. <laughs> Cleve Jones is a human rights activist who has devoted his life's work to social, economic, and health justice. In 1982, Cleve was one of the first people to recognize the threat that HIV and AIDS would cause, and in response, he co-founded what would become San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Cleve is also the founder of the Names Project and the AIDS Memorial Quilt. His work and personal story has made it to the big and small screen, and he is the author of two books telling the story of the HIV and LGBT movements. He's an inspiring leader who has touched and benefited the lives of all. Cleve is also the only man to publicly call me a hussy. <laughs> it's true, at my first gala. Thanks, Cleve. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, author and activist and inspiration, Cleve Jones. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You are beautiful. I've never been to this before and that's blowing my mind. You're amazing, thank you. It's such an honor to be part of this tonight. Okay, sit down. Uh, uh, this is really a astonishing. This is what a movement looks like. This is what a community looks like. And I'm really genuinely blown away by it. Um, this is June. 50 years ago, I graduated from high school in Phoenix, Arizona. And I'd read about gay liberation in Life magazine as I was getting ready to kill myself, and I read about it, and I flushed the pills down the toilet, and I skipped graduation, and I hitchhiked to San Francisco. <laughs> I was amazingly fortunate. I was an idiot street kid, you know, from Scottsdale, and uh, living homeless. I was a homeless kid. I had to do a lot of things I didn't want to do to survive. I know what it's like to fear the police. I know what it's like to be mistreated by your own people. And that's uh, an experience that has stayed with me all through these decades. But I was very lucky. And uh, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the origins of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. In 1980, in the aftermath of the assassination of my mentor, Harvey Milk, and our dear friend, Mayor George Moscone, and the riots that followed the verdict, I got hired by the Speaker of the Assembly to work in the California legislature. His name was Leo McCarthy. And he, for unex <laughs> unexplained reasons, assigned me to the health committee. I knew nothing about public health issues, so I subscribed to every possible journal so I could immediately get informed on the issues. One of those was the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report published by the Centers for Disease Control out of Atlanta. And it was there in June of 1981 that I read that first three paragraphs describing clusters of gay men in Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York City who were coming down with Kaposi's sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia and whose immune systems were being destroyed. I knew something was wrong. And I cut that out and I remember putting it up on my bulletin board and about two weeks later I got a call from a physician, a dermatologist named Dr. Marcus Conant. You should applaud every time you hear the name Dr. Marcus Conant. He was a dermatologist at UC San Francisco and in his practice he saw the first, the very first patients who were presenting with Kaposi's sarcoma. And he called me up and he said, I don't know what this is, but I want to take you out to dinner and I want to tell you what I think. He took me to a lovely place called the Zuni Cafe. It's still there on Market Street. <laughs> and, and he said, I think it's sexually transmitted. I think it's a virus that attacks the immune system. I don't think we're going to find a cure anytime soon. And I think it's ultimately fate fatal. And 
he, he said it in such an understated, non-dramatic kind of way. And I remember just thinking to myself, my God, we're, we're all going to die then. That was the summer of 1981. By the fall of 1985, almost everyone I knew was dead or dying or caring for people who were dying. And we were on our own. There was no cavalry coming over the hill to save us. We were on our own, whether it was LA or New York or Wichita or Tampa, we were on our own. And it was our community that immediately understood that we didn't just have to fight a virus. We had to fight a parallel epidemic of bigotry and ignorance, fear and hatred. We, we had to fight racism. We had to fight transphobia and homophobia. We had to understand the impact of income inequality on access to health care. We had to learn about harm reduction for drug and alcohol use. We had to learn about incarceration. We had to understand the role of sexism and the way this epidemic affects women and girls. And you would have thought we would have learned an awful lot of lessons. And we did. And you did. But this last two years, it's been really hard for me to see the same mistakes play out again. And yes, the diseases are very different. No question about it. But so much of these two pandemics has been the same. Both emerged with presidents in the White House who failed to perceive the gravity of the situation and then mocked those who were most afflicted. In both pandemics. There was the attempt to say it only happens to them. Calling it a China virus was as despicable as calling it a gay virus and as stupid and as unscientific. Once again we see angry parents storming school boards, furious about what's being done to protect their children and saying that they know better and no, don't tell our children the truth. And once again, we see the terrible, damning discrepancy in outcome due to race. Once again, we see that black and brown are more likely to be infected, more likely to be hospitalized, and more likely to die. So when you're riding that bike in the rain, you're not just raising millions and millions of dollars for services, but you're putting your muscle and your sweat and your heart and your love into sustaining a movement that from the very beginning in LA and San Francisco and everywhere else our siblings fought has always been part of the larger global struggle for peace and for social justice. That is what we are about. That is what you are about. And I am so very grateful that you are alive and fighting and that I'm getting old knowing that you are going to sustain that fight for as long as you live. Thank you. <laughs> now today is historic. You've raise more money than they've ever done before, which is an amazing thing. And we also have some new leadership to celebrate in LA, where that hussy has gone to take over. And in San Francisco, we are very fortunate, I think, uh, to have uh, found a new leader in Dr. Tyler Tamir. Um, we've only spent a little bit of time together, but every time we do, I like you more, I trust you more, I feel that you are... Uh, I, I think, you know, when, when Joe took over, there were some problems. And Joe did an amazing job. And now we're, the stage is set, I think, for you to take us to a whole new place. And I understand that we have a little video about you. So, video?